18, I wanted to uh, go to Kathmandu. So those days you could get a bus, double-decker bus. I think it's called the Magic Bus. You get on in London. <laughs> you get on in London, and uh, you travel for about 108 days, 110 days, and you drive overland to so all through Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and uh, Persia. In those days, it was Persia. So the world has really changed, hasn't it? So you drive all the way to Kathmandu, and um, those days on this converted double-decker bus. So those days, I had enough money to get there, and I had no money to get back. So I said to my parents, I want to go to Kathmandu, and they said, please go to university first. So I went to university, I had four years, including one year in Germany, Tübingen and Vienna, studying and travelling around Europe. In those days we had the East, East Europe, and you know, Europe was divided. So again, the world has changed a lot. And then when I was coming to my final year at university, um, there was uh, the Falklands War, so the country went to war, and I felt very disillusioned to be in a country that was at war. That didn't, uh, that didn't fit with me, and the way the war was being treated, to me, it was more like a football match, you know. So I decided that I would, uh, it was time for me to go, so I bought a one-way ticket to Delhi, and I put a little knapsack on my back, and I left, I left home. So I often say, that when I was at uh, school, uh, we had a little um, area with uh, careers advice. And they advised you to become journalists or teachers or doctors or nurses, but nobody ever recommended that I become a Buddhist nun. <laughs> and when I went to university, there were many people who were paid to advise you to get a job, and again, nobody ever recommended that I become a Buddhist nun. So, and when I, I packed up and I left for Delhi, I had absolutely no intention of doing anything spiritual. But a month later, I was um, doing a course on Buddhism, and it made sense to me. Okay. I remember when I first came to the monastery, I often tell this story. When I first walked up to the monastery in uh, Kathmandu, Kapan, Gomba. This is over 30 years ago when um, the Kathmandu Valley was still rice fields, paddy fields, and uh, now it's all developed, it's all, it's all grown up. Those days you walked over the fields and you kept asking where the monastery was and they point to a hill and you keep on walking. And when I first arrived there, um, I was with a friend and he went to sign up to do the course. He decided he wanted to be a Buddhist monk. He actually never became a Buddhist monk. <laughs> I never became a Buddhist nun. And I sat outside, and the first thing I saw when I walked into the monastery was this Buddhist nun, and she had a cup of coffee in one hand and a piece of cake in the other hand. And she was sitting there, and my, my first thought was, oh, so they have nuns? Because I had no idea there was such a thing as a Buddhist nun. You know, we, we, we hear about Buddhist monks, but we don't hear about nuns, do we? And then I thought, well, if that's what it's like being a Buddhist nun, that's what I want to do with my life. <laughs> of course, my life hasn't exactly been drinking coffee and eating cake, <laughs> but still. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have not really a, a, a good idea in Europe what means to be a Buddhist nun. Right. Can you tell me what are the rules? What was your experience? What is allowed to do? What is not allowed for you? Oh, well, you know, we have, we have vows that we take for life. I mean, the, actually, the monastic vows, they're the same as the monk's vows. Um, at least uh, the novice vows, uh, the same as the novice monk's vows. Um, but the motivation, actually, from the point of view of the monastic vows, is achieving liberation for oneself, individual liberation, pradimoksha, individual liberation. In the Mahayana tradition, which uh, Tibetan Buddhism is, is Mahayana, it's the universal vehicle. So it's seeking enlightenment. The motivation is not individual liberation, the motivation is to achieve enlightenment. So it's a choice if you want to uh, live a celibate life and completely devote yourself to teachings, or if you want to live a lay life. That's a choice, it's an individual choice. And then if you choose that way, then when you take these individual liberation vows, then you take them with a mind motivation. That means you become a monk or nun, uh, with the wish to be able to devote yourself more fully to the practice so you can achieve enlightenment, you can be of service. I mean, in my case, really, 
the reason I wanted to take ordination was I felt that this is what I wanted to do with my life and um, very much I wanted to make sure that my teacher, Ram Sovereign that his teachings were made available. I wanted to help Ram to bring these teachings to more people because I found them so beneficial in my life. As to what it means to be um, Buddhist monk or nun, it can take so many forms because there are so many different kinds of people, everyone has a different mentality. For some people it means studying intensively, some people learn Tibetan, they speak fluent Tibetan, they go to the monasteries and they debate, they spend years studying um, philosophy and that. Some people study in English. We have monasteries in France, a very good monastery in France. We have um, monastic institutions in Australia and around the world. Um, and then uh, some, for some people it means working, for some people it means studying, for some people it means teaching, for some people it means drawing, for some people it means cooking, you know, it can be anything. Okay. So you have many paths, you have devotional paths, paths of service, paths of study, paths of teaching. It depends on the individual and their particular inclination. But the, the general idea is that you have less distraction. Uh, because you don't have the concerns of family life, you don't have the concerns of working in the family life. You know, once you have a family, then you have to support the family, obviously. Uh, you're in a relationship, then support the family, then you're going to need, you're going to need somewhere to live, you're going to need a phone, you're going to need a job, you're going to need a computer, you're going to need clothes, you're going to need... I was thinking to myself the other day that over 27 years, over the 27 or 28 years that I've been a nun, I wonder how much money I've spent, I've, I've saved on clothes and cosmetics. I've seen it must be thousands of dollars. This thought came to me, it must be thousands and thousands of dollars, wasn't that? Because I know it's, it's a lot of money in the West, especially if you have a job and you have to, um, you have a certain lifestyle that you have to keep up with. Thousands of dollars. Yeah. So, I mean, one set of robes will last me quite a few years. <laughs> Basically, they're, they're, they're uh, teaching about your own mind, about your life. They're teaching uh, the Buddha. The Buddha psychology is uh, is very deep, very profound. But at the same time, I think it can easily be grasped. So when we do these ten day courses, generally I start off and I explain a little bit the first couple of days just Buddhist psychology. Why do we get angry? Um, what kind of emotions produce happiness? What kind of emotions produce suffering? We talk about how to generate loving kindness, compassion, not in a limited way, but uh, to train ourselves for that mind to become unlimited. We talk about attachment. And, um, you know, I challenge people to think a little bit about attachment and whether it really brings happiness or whether when they look more closely they can see that attachment can actually be a painful, painful mind that tortures us because we cling to the object, we, we get stuck on the object, we get dependent, we have expectations. Um, and rather than uh, being complete in and of ourselves, we start looking for something outside to make ourselves happy. And that mind that's constantly looking outside, of course, is an unhappy mind. And people can immediately relate to it and understand it. I, I don't think this is, this is difficult. So even from the very beginning, I think you can get a clear understanding. In Buddhism, we explain why we get angry. Two reasons why we ever get angry, right? Somebody does something we don't want. They don't do something we do want. We get angry. And it's all focused around me. <clears throat> and the world should do everything that I want. You know, the world is there for me, to make me happy. So this kind of sense of entitlement we have. Um, particularly in the West, we have, a, we have a huge sense of entitlement. And it's very interesting, when you examine this mind, it produces dissatisfaction. Constant dissatisfaction. Whereas just with a simple movement of the mind to appreciation, how much I have in my life, how much others do, how precious others are, how important others are. I mean, this is just moving the mind. This is not difficult. And suddenly things change and you have more joy. So it's very interesting. These are just learning how to think differently. You can make a huge difference. And then, of course, as you go along in the spiritual path, you go deeper and deeper into all the mechanisms of the mind that cause suffering and you start trying to unpack the whole thing and learn how to develop mechanisms that produce suffering instead. 
So I think this is this is uh, very valuable. It's very challenging. It's not at all boring. It's quite dynamic. You're always learning more about your mind. And of course, if you have if you get into a relationship with a with a guru, who uh, whose job is to uh, challenge your ego and your self-cherishing all the time, it gets even more dynamic and even more challenging. So it makes life really quite exciting. Yeah. So I, I, I enjoy sharing this with others. And I think most people at the end of the course, when we do these courses, our goal is not to make people Buddhist. Um, our goal is just to introduce a different worldview and allow people to find out what their own worldview is. So I think at the end of your course, there was somebody who came to me and uh, he was really very moved. Uh, he'd been reading um, a book about the dialogue between Buddhism and other religions, and uh, he came from Israel, and he read the section on Judaism, and he had this profound realization that in, from his heart he was, he was uh, Jewish. And just tears came, and he suddenly re re reconnected with his own faith. And he came to tell me that, and I was, I was extremely happy. And of course, before there was um, a rabbi who came undercover, and at the end of the course he came up, and he thanked me and he said, you just proved to me the um, universality of truth which exists in all religions. And similarly, you know, I have people come and they say to me, well, you didn't manage to prove to, you didn't manage to persuade me to become a Buddhist, but you did persuade me to lead a better life. You know, so secular ethics, some more understanding about uh, the kindness of others, not harming others. In a secular way, which which I think is success, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
They were very uh, withdrawn. <clears throat> I think this is probably part of the culture. And that's now changing. Now we have uh, um, several nunneries where the nuns are doing exactly the same study curriculum as the monks and they're taking the same examinations and I think uh, the next 20 years is going to be even more of a radical transformation. The Tibetan Buddhism actually has changed enormously since, since the Tibetans left, um, came into exile and was contact with the outside world. So you'll find that there are many uh, Western uh, female teachers in Buddhism, many of them. Whereas within Tibetan Buddhism, you don't find that many. They are there, they are there, but you don't find that many at the moment. But I would predict in the next 10, 20 years, there'll be more and more and more. And it just takes, they just need role models, really, and then it'll take off. So His Honours has said uh, many times that yes, if it's more beneficial to come back in a female body, he'll come back in a female body. He said that. But he's also said that if he comes back in a female body, he's going to be very attractive, <laughs> very beautiful, very charming. We have one female teacher in our organization who's Tibetan. She's actually um, very highly realized. And she's young, but she's very highly realized. And she teaches more from her realization, I think, than from study basis. She's very close to Natana Lama and also very close to um, many other lamas. And um, that has been extremely helpful in giving us as Westerners role models. So we can see what a female teacher really is like. And, uh, and she, of course, always appears extremely humble and uh, very, very gracious, very humble. Um, so it's an interesting model. On the one hand, you need to be strong and confident in order to, you know, take on this new role as a woman and teach, but on the other hand, very humble, very respectful.